All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Alessandro Orsini. Um, I am an adjunct assistant professor here at Columbia University GSAP. Um, I am uh, teaching in the um, advanced um, uh, sequence uh, studios and in the professional practice. Um, and in the context of my professional practice, practice course, um, uh, I have organized this um, fall semester uh, a symposium that revolves around um, the idea of practice, what does it mean to practice today, um, and uh, especially uh, taking into account um, all the challenges that we have uh, revolving around climate, uh, labor, equity. Um, and um, I, in order to do so, I put together um, a group of speakers which are practitioners, academic, researcher, um, that are here today. Framing uh, the symposium a little bit, we're thinking practice. Um, the disentanglement between architecture and politics is at the foundation of the biases of the profession and intertwined with changing financial and technological regime. Uh, <clears throat> these, these photos of the Crystal Palace is uh, paradigmatic of that. Um, at the end of the first industrial revolution, the Crystal Palace, a building suspended between uh, an industrial capitalist uh, future and a colonized past, became the symbol of the future. The political forces of one nation are placed in the hands of an architect tasked with representing power using novel tectonic materials um, such as glass and steel. Um, this is a painting uh, by Henry Wyndham Phillips, um, which shows actually how the whole planning of the, of the Crystal Palace took place, um, instituting actually a, um, uh, a royal commission for the exhibition of uh, 1851, uh, which was um, sort of um, presided by uh, Prince Albert. So the use of steel, as I said, became the symbol of construction. <clears throat> Novel tectonic employing the girder technique in the making of the Crystal Palace. This prefabricated component allowed to advance construction at a speed unforeseen before, um, one acre per week. The vaulted transect was built with ribs of eight foot per model, hoisted on steel columns. A wagon on tracks was designed to allow for a fast placement of the glazed flat roof. Um, again, highlighting uh, technology as the advancement of construction. In the interwar period, architecture became associated with nations and states' desire to exploit the disciplined social nature for governmental and ideological representation. With the advent of a totalitarian neoliberal regimes, architecture practice was enmeshed with ethical questions manifesting through specific aesthetics. This is a photo of uh, the UR in Rome, uh, an entire neighbor uh, that was built for the uh, World uh, Exposition in 1942 and is paradigmatic of uh, what in Italy became um, the fascist style of architecture. Furthermore, um, after the Second World War, the modernist canon with its exclusionary and anti-intersectional values changed the architectural practice into a business model that commodified architecture, refusing politics and ethics. Architecture's core value, historically stemming from processes of colonialism, capitalism, and patriarchy, have shaped the discourse within the practice and educational institution 
preventing the discipline from addressing essential question of social justice, labor, and material extraction. Uh, here is a, a, a photo on the left of the Vitruvian Man, um, in a drawing of uh, Leonardo da Vinci and the modular of Corbusier, two of the cornerstone of the exclusionary dynamics of the Western architecture canon. Both were um, modeled after the ideal white Western um, man's proportion. The modern masters um, had provided nearly a half a century of pedagogical domination as figure, subjects, and icons, which lived in perpetuity, literally and metaphorically, through their lasting influence and their hold on architectural pedagogy and thought. Um, here you can see uh, the cover of uh, Race and Modern Architecture by Irene Chang. Charles Davis II and Mabel Wilson, um, just opposed with one image that is in the book um, highlighting uh, the, the, the modern American house, which became uh, the representation of uh, the heteronormative family, the patriarchal structure, and the exclusionary dynamic of women um, in the life of the house. Today, Architecture began to examine the dynamics that produce these systemic inequalities, such as pathways to licensure um, and lack of representation of women, BIPOC, and queer community. Here, there are some examples. You can see the Black Reconstruction Collective of the MoMA, um, <clears throat> a photo from the architectural lobby, and um, a women in practice. Um, architecture and its related fields are also undeniably intertwined with climate change and fundamental labor issue, uh, issues through economic interest historically supporting the built environment. Um, as a reaction over the past few years, we have witnessed a proliferation of alternative uh, practices focusing on issues of uh, racial capitalism, gender, sexuality, and politics shaping a multiplicity of unorthodox configuration, ranging from uh, cooperatives, non-profit, and research-based agency. Uh, <clears throat> I wanted to highlight a uh, few things here. Uh, this is the cover of Log, which was edited by um, Bernie Roberts, which is here today with us. Um, Bernheimer Architecture, uh, which is a firm that uh, succeeded in the, their unionization very recently. Um, the logo of the architectural lobby that uh, so much is instrumental um, <clears throat> in understanding and promoting this question of labor in architecture. And then there is a photo of the design advocates, um, a group of uh, uh, designers and architects that um, got together um, uh, roughly around um, COVID um, as, a, as a sort of a, a collective to help um, with um, underrepresented communities and, and, and so on with um, uh, pro bono projects. Um, the Rethinking Practice Symposium aims to promote a dialogue around a radical practicing to address the discipline exclusionary dynamics to prompt models that allow architects to reclaim agency over the design processes ethics and the conditional labor under which architecture operates. Um, this is a slide uh, showing a diagram of the architectural lobby. Um, it is really paradigmatic to see how cooperativizing architecture um, <clears throat> allows to intertwine uh, all these questions that are very much um, a problem today in architecture. The benefit, the, the structure of the work, the collaboration between the contractor, the engineers, the consultant, um, and so on. <clears throat> the symposium asks how to redefine and reshape the practice as an alternative to corporate structure and their refusal of ethics to re-engage architecture with its core values of politics in a collective effort to tackle climate change, race, and gender, among others. 
the symposium centers around conversation that interpret, reflect, and analyze spatial practice to reassemble it into alternative modes that form new kinship among workers, the architects, the client, and the environment. These alternative practices reframe how to approach information gathering and exploration of aesthetics, geometries, and materials in a task to undo the biases of the discipline. Um, these two photos are from a summer, um, last summer festival, um, a collective vision uh, th that sees the participation of Mayo architects and most architects all engaging the local community of a very small town uh, in the south of Italy. Furthermore, the symposium reinforces the strong relationship between the academic space and the space of the practice, a connection that is part of the ecosystem of ideas, speculation, and practice at Columbia University GSAT. So what is practice? What does it mean to practice? How do we conduct practice? What are form of practice? These are a few questions that I, um, I ask my student in uh, my professional practice course, but I can uh, rely to the interlocutors today to, to try to answer or to, um, in a sense, address. So as I said, um, to answer this question, uh, I wanted to put together uh, a symposium that uh, is Interactive is um, where, where the participants are literally interlocutors to each other, but also um, everyone here in the room can interact um, and ask questions and, um, and so on. So I try to assemble a group of uh, practitioners that um, some of them are part of uh, my generation, Architension's generation, uh, my office that I co-lead with Nick Roseborough that is here today. Uh, and some of them are younger practices, um, all of them with specificity in the way they, uh, they practice, in the way they focus on certain part of the research, um, and also in the way they structure their offices. Um, so, um, in order to do that, um, I started to develop this um, diagram which um, shows the, the year of foundation of the firms uh, together with their locality um, and, and with uh, uh, their previous experience. Um, and also uh, the place of uh, their education. Um, it is interesting to see how there are some overlapping, <clears throat> and, um, and, and, and that's, that's the reason why uh, I hope that the conversation will be uh, a very fruitful conversation. Um, the symposium is divided in three sessions. The session number one um, is the one revolving around uh, climate. I, I want to say is something very specific. Um, the, the subdivision into the three section um, does not mean that we cannot talk about the other uh, sort of topics. Um, equity, climate, and labor are profoundly intertwined. Um, but so the first question sees the participation of um, uh, Nick Roseborough of Architensions. I'm gonna I'm gonna give um, a brief introduction to uh, to the uh, par participants. Um, Architensions Research um, operate. Uh, this is a this is an agency that operates uh, internationally with base in Rome and Brooklyn. Works at the intersection of theory, practice, and academia, focusing on architecture as a network condition, in continuous dialogue with the political the social context, and aiming at creating new possibility for the contemporary city. Uh, Nick Rosborough uh, is a partner since 2013, a designer and a musician with a cross-disciplinary experience. Um, he also teaches at Syracuse, New York, 
and Sarah Lawrence College, where he is the endowed chair of environmental architecture and sustainable design. Um, Richie Yao of uh, Dash Marshall, or Dash, um, is a Brooklyn-based uh, and Detroit-based um, uh, firm with three partners, Richie Yao, Amy Young, and Brian Boyer. The studio works across scales from uh, the perfect place to read a book up to the urban proposal that helps cities ensure new technology, such as autonomous vehicles, generative, uh, generate positive outcomes for everyday people. Prior to co-founding Dash, um, Richie worked at um, OMA um, and um, currently teaches uh, at Harvard uh, GSD. Um, <clears throat> Evie Diamantopoulos of uh, Neo Affiliates. Uh, Neo Affiliates is an award-winning New York-based studio led by Evie Diamantopoulos and Jaffer Kolb. Uh, they have completed a range of work from ground-up project to interiors to exhibition and installation for institutions including the New York's Jewish Museum, the Shed, and the Park Avenue Armory, among others. Evie is a Register architect in Greece and New York, and prior to co-founding New Affiliates, he worked at Moss Architects. So I welcome uh, the three speakers. Um, first, uh, Nick. They will give um, a very brief presentation of their work, like five to six minutes, and then we'll proceed to have uh, a conversation all together. Thank you. Okay, can everyone hear me? Perfect, it's my Zoom, my Zoom times, that's what I think about. Okay, as Alessandro said, um, I'm Nick Rosgrove Architections, uh, an international architectural design studio operating um, as an agen agency of research um, led by both of us, um, and based in New York and Rome. I want to start by saying that some of the slides that we're gonna to show today are um, they're not in any particular order, and I'm going to speak to them briefly. Um, maybe one that is more important to what we'll talk about um, within the discussion. Um, but I'm going to center our climate around um, labor, leisure, and equity. So let's see what we have here. We work at the intersection of theory and practice in academia, focusing on architecture as a network condition and continuous dialogue with the political and social context. We aim to create new possibilities for responsibly living together. Our search for an aesthetic is an ever-changing process grounded in drawings, collage, sketches, and models. We like to sweep geometries and grids, but consistently seek new interpretations of their spatial outcomes. Researching and teaching for us is a mode of practice not just in the academic space, but also in our studio. We believe in a pedagogical approach to practice where we design and we learn. At the same time, we expand our practice through writing and to critically connect to the ontology of our work with the discourse and curating to index the diverse architectural trajectories of our time. Design and research for us is, a, is, a, is seen as a way to define and bring forth fields of action for the built environment that reconnect urbanism and architecture to processes that promote inclusivity and challenge the current architecture paradigm with society's environmental, political, and social tension. Our research concerning the commons and the collective in the public sphere um, of the public culture, labor, leisure, and domesticity addresses critical aspects of our society's production and reproduction cycle. The research, the research aims to reframe the concept of the commons and the collective from a transdisciplinary lens, examining how commoning practices have, can shape not just the urban spaces, but the architecture of the built environment itself, and facilitate 
the accessibility to resources such as the right to housing, leisure, healthcare, education, work, and food. In fact, we look at projects through a multi multidisciplinary lens beyond the built. One example is transformation. Transformation or readaptive readapt reuse of a building, transcending its original use. The social construct of the building and research into how to address the structure itself, its material, and therefore climate. One example that speaks lightly to this, we were recently commissioned um, by the town of San Ferdinando in Calabria, Italy, along with the nonprofit Viseo to devise a vision plan. This plan was developed with the help of this nonprofit, not as a way to solve issues, but to understand the existing difficulties. If one can even devise a plan, it can be limited if engagement is missing from the equation and understanding what type of engagement is needed in that context, specifically. We were commissioned to curate and co-organize a festival as a laboratory of urban regeneration through art, architecture, and culture with an active participation from the community. It consists of two artist residencies, a series of workshops, and public events as a way to celebrate the town and garner interest. The festival aims to advance a project of culture, urban, and social values of the village by encouraging the participation of the community, focusing on a vision that promotes the commons, centering equality, accessibility to resources, and alternative forms of mutual health. The commons concern with domesticity confronts the power structure and organization of the house and its inhabitants. The spatiality of the house, still defined by the binary relationships of, of the traditional family, can be reconceptualized through questions of equity, gender, and race. Through transgressing the traditional domestic space, the house in this complex social, social network of private and public, and its form can be rearranged to incorporate aspects of collective living. Designing housing for everyone should not be about minimums or fast solutions, but responsible design solutions and transformation to the existing building that still have an aesthetic value, not only in old values, but new ones that speak to the present and to the future. The question of the right of housing is something we think about in our, uh, on our studio and how architecture and architects cannot solve it outright, as one knows, but promotes the, what architecture inherently was meant to promote. And for that, for us, that is how to live together, work together, and even leisure together. We speak of labor in the discourse and often forget its counterpart, leisure. They both go hand in hand and they are inextricably linked and never to break apart, yet they need each other. The sites of leisure are sites of, la uh, uh, are sites of labor intertwined and influencing each other. As seen in this uh, conceptual drawing exhibited at 883. We work to live in leisure to live and architecture is intertwined in this cycle. It brings up questions about the practice of architecture and the architect's agency in times of scarcity and overabundance. What needs to be designed, planned, developed, or landscaped? Who is your client and how are we, or how are they involved beyond necessity and desire? These are some questions we at Architectures think about what we have stated before and related to commoning and collective in housing and other types of projects. Collective spaces of learning, sharing of knowledge and resources, and conceptual ideas that exist as megabytes that maybe help usher not only ourselves in this room to rethink practice, but those to follow further, not to limit the conceptual underpinning of architecture, 
but land it in something real by continuing to explore, ask, collaborate, and work together on a way of a new commons. Thank you. Alexander, do I just click on this? Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Richie Yao. Um, I'm a partner at Dash Marshall. Our studio is based in Brooklyn and also Detroit. Uh, and I also teach at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. Um, so for today, I think I'll be going over two categories of research within our studio. Um, the first component's called Civic Futures. Um, I'll be speaking about five projects within that. and. The second component um, is a category that we call domestic futures, and I'll be speaking about three projects within that um, category. So they're parallel, but there's a lot of difference between them as well. This first project is called Made in Korea. Uh, we completed it at the heart of the pandemic in the summer of 2021. And if you remember during the pandemic, a lot of the Asian communities, uh, Chinatown, Koreatown, saw a huge drop in foot traffic, partly associated with the stigma associated with the Asian community. So this project was built on the corner of K-Town. It's on 32nd Street. It used to be an abandoned, um, the, the lot was abandoned because it was meant to be a luxury condo that was put on hold during the pandemic. And one thing unique about Koreatown, if y'all have been there, is that it's one of the neighborhoods that doesn't have just bars and restaurants on the ground floor. So you have a lot of bars, restaurants, which were on the upper floor, some as high as seven floor, and they could not take advantage of the open street programs that New York City had. So with the open street program, different stores and bars can take over the sidewalk or the parking lot in front of their property. Um, the idea came about creating this public-private space where different restaurants who did not have access can participate um, using this space. So when you sat down on a table, scanned the QR code, um, you would get a digital menu and you can order from all the restaurants that just did not have access to open streets. This project we also completed at the summer of 2020. We were invited um, to propose uh, an intervention for Care for Hudson Square. Hudson Square it was originally one of the first printing districts in New York, so we wanted to kind of bring this history back to life. So it's a very simple project, simple structure. Um, View stand, we imagine, was you know uh, a node where people can come, have a chat about local politics, um, the weather, have a cup of coffee, similar to the way newsstands in the past functioned. Santa's Hollow, we completed last year uh, as part of the Neighborhoods Now uh, initiative with the Van Allen Institute and the Urban Design Forum. One of the unique things about this structure versus the other temporary structures that we design is that you can, um, it's designed to be modular and it's designed where you can disassemble it, reassemble it uh, on a seasonal basis. So if you live in bed it should be going up, I think, around Thanksgiving. This is like a yearly thing that uh, they have on Marcy's Plaza. Um, Detroit Public Theater, this is an adaptive reuse project. It's a federally designated landmark building. Um, one of the biggest challenge for this project was how to convert a building um, which was designed to house uh, automotive cars into a modern theater. So if you think about a garage, typically the load path is on the ground. You just support heavy cars. Versus in theaters, um, a lot of the load path tends to be on the ceiling. So the, the building was quite beautiful, had these like um, landmark trusses, and they had to be carefully restored uh, to be able to hold the capacity of the theater equipment. This is the first show that, that that went up, Mud Row. Uh, if you're ever in Detroit, go check it out. Detroit Public Theater is an awesome, awesome uh, organization. A lot of BIPOC-led uh, events. And we also designed a pretty killer bar that you can have drinks 
Um, it's Friday, it's never too late to think about drinking. <laughs> um, People Party, this is a self-initiated app within our studio that we develop. As I mentioned before, our studio mainly operates in Brooklyn and Detroit. Detroit is a 80% black uh, city. And one thing as, as we're developing projects in Detroit, we notice it's quite hard to kind of accurately depict the demographics of uh, the city in our renderings. You know. um, so what we created was this app that's tied to the Census Bureau data. This is like the opening page that you would see when you log into it. It'll ask you what city. So recently we just upgraded, I think there should be 648 cities now, all 50 states. So let's say uh, Puerto Rico, it will populate your scene in Puerto Rico accurate to the census data. And the other component that we wanted the app to kind of uh, have was just like a quicker, efficient workflow. Um, in our studio, we're, we're very, uh, work-life balance is important for us, so the faster you get tasks done, the faster we get to go out and be at the park, see our kids. So here is like, the same scene, but you can see that we've automated the, the tedious task of just changing the colors of the clothing, right? So we, we tried to have fun. If you log into it, there's multiple themes, and you can also create your own themes. Uh, the next series of work is, uh, they fall under the category of domestic futures. The, the main kind of thread line here is our research into domesticity and the courtyard housing type. So these are three projects which are currently ongoing in our studio. The first project, uh, the Donut Courtyard Plan in Detroit. Um, it's in the urban prairie. Um, it's in a neighborhood which has seen a lot of disinvestment. Top corner over there is a um, project in a very suburban New Jersey context. And then finally, uh, the plan up here in Long Island, it's in a coastal property. Um, images of, three, of the three projects, you got New Jersey, Detroit in the middle, and then uh, Long Island um, to the right. So this is Micromix. This is currently in construction. Um, like I mentioned before, it's in a neighborhood which has seen a lot of disinvestment. It's for a young family with a young toddler. So the, the, the sense of security was really important for them to have a plan where they can see their kids um, running around in an open space and be able to view them from different parts of the room. The donut plan also gives them uh, flexibility in configuring it multiple ways. Um, the Norwood Edition project, outwardly, when you look at it, it looks like it might be an ADU, uh, but when you look at it in plan, um, it's clearly connected. So it's designed for a multi-generational family um, who wants to bring in their aging parents to live with them. So the whole plan is designed where uh, two families can live at once, but it's also fairly connected. If you look at the, at the bottom left, the living room, there's a, a sequence of inside-outside spaces. So all this connects um, through sliding doors and windows. Um, so the plan has this flexibility, but from the outside, it looks like two different buildings. And then finally, this project uh, that we're calling Two Bar House, um, it's in a coastal property. Recently, we just got the wetlands permit approved. Uh, two bars parting open and courtyard conditions right in the middle. So it's, it's an experimentation in the courtyard housing type, but also like the dog trot housing type. And uh, hopefully it'll go in construction soon. And that's about it. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Alessandra. Thanks, everybody, for joining bright and early this morning. This will be very informal. Um, so my name is Evie Diamantopoulou. Uh, I come from new affiliates, a practice I co-founded in 2016 together with Dr. Kolb, who is not here today. So in developing a practice for us, uh, it's been kind of a cyclical experience of occupying a known and seemingly well-defined sort of uh, model. 
Um, but each time we do so in a, with, uh, with the intent to observe, to critique, to question its parameters. We break off, we experiment, we research, we collaborate, and then we try again. Uh, in other words, early on we made a commitment to making things, and we continue to make through questioning the very act of making, um, in a way that is incremental, soft, uh, and, uh, I don't know, just to repeat myself in a 30 second talk, cyclical. <laughs> um, uh, we continue to pursue this one project at a time, and I figured uh, I would keep this very short today and introduce our practice through a handful of projects. Um, a lot of our work begins or revolves uh, as a practice in New York City around exhibition design and large-scale installation. Uh, we've experimented with the impact of you know, temporal uh, um, uh, construction, and we've experimented with rentals, like our installation on the right for the Park Avenue Armory, all of it was kind of brought in a track and left on a track, uh, but it somehow does not feel that uh, that was enough. And uh, we invented this project, named Museums Remodeled, to really deal with our own, our own guilt of the things we make, the things we bring into sites, and how we might disperse them back into the world and design their afterlives. Uh, for that, we collaborated with a department of sanitation, uh, um, again, like a cold call that led us into a lot of additional work for a you know, for-profit entity, uh, but work that felt meaningful and work that felt like uh, if we did enough each time, it could be more and more embedded into our process, our fees, and our structure uh, as, a, as a firm. Uh, from there, uh, we also wanted to share this project called Viral is Forever, commissioned by the Arts Organization Performa in 2019, in which we explored the multiple lives of drywall, uh, specifically as they pertain within uh, the art world. This is something like two weeks of drywall sent it to a recycling facility in Pennsylvania for reuse. This is all unpatched CNB waste. Uh, it's quite amazing. This is me for reference. I'm not particularly small and I'm also not eight feet tall. So uh, I think this can help you uh, orient yourselves. So really, uh, we started to experiment with uh, what it would mean to produce a different kind of desire that embeds these byproducts back into the stream, not as a guilt washing project, but as, a, as an exciting one, one that is, you know, comes from a place of optimism. Um, we built this wall ourselves, which is something we very much enjoy, uh, and we don't get to do very much as architects, and we were very bad at it. It took two weeks to build a little wall. Uh, but we trust that uh, expertise could have steered this project a different way. Uh, uh, for a party recently, uh, or I guess a year and a half ago, for the Architectural League of New York, we uh, experimented with different types of collaboration. We worked with a party provider from the Hamptons uh, to put together a series of ice joint details uh, that brought leftover materials found in the larger vicinity where the party was happening um, and held together by eyes. So you see on the left the before, it's the Navy Yard. Uh, in the middle are uh, uh, Nacho from our team, Mariah Carey, whose panels we found left over in some storage facility there in the Navy Yard. And in the end, the post-party picture of everything we brought into the site melting into the sewer. Uh, after it's uh, after the parties and um, we come into this project with the desire to create new types of collaboration to make new friends to uh, test different kinds of expertise see you know Hamptons ice sculpting facilities uh, but we also want to bring our own expertise as architects try to understand how it can find a space uh, and meaning in this uh, Kind of other contexts. Um, a long-term project of ours that takes this logic uh, to, I don't know, the its biggest extreme within the realm of our practice uh, is Testbed, a project we do, uh, we invented with uh, Sam Stuart Halavi, who is a PhD candidate here and maybe your professor uh, for a seminar, uh, if you're lucky. And uh, we did this project in collaboration with New York City's Parks Department. 
Uh, the project looks to architectural mockups, you know, really elaborate artifacts uh, made to test design uh, across scale. Uh, and sees those, again, as an opportunity to redistribute resources across New York's uh, landscape. The project came out of the sort of construction boom of luxury development, millionaire's row, Phi Dai happening uh, at some point in 2016, where, you know, it was, honestly, when we started our firm, it was a lot easier to be very optimistic, you know, to harness the energy of architecture that was abandoned, of building cranes, everyone in New York City. And uh, this has shifted quite obviously where we are now, but this is the, the kind of genesis of the project, to say that there is so much going on, but it's concentrated at sites of development that exclude a large portion of the five boroughs. So our idea was to you know, team up with the parks department and uh, imagine us redirecting these resources uh, out into the gardens. Um, and um, this initiative resulted in uh, a built structure in the Rockaways, uh, in, in Edgemere, Queens, where we relocated, you see this, four panels and uh, a window that broke in the process, but that is a different story, uh, uh, to build a community structure. Um, again, we, what we brought was the mock-up, but also the resources, the labor, the funding, the support. <coughs> Uh, that's, you know, this other kind of industry holds within it. Or in Alessandro's words, maybe the power that is concentrated in certain types of design and development. Uh, amazingly, you know, we worked with this wonderful people. The garden was able to get uh, even more members. Uh, on the bottom image, they expanded to the site next door, which was originally designated for HBD and uh, finally was kind of given back to the parks department, uh, given the, the sort of excitement for the project and the number of participants. Uh, just to show something newer and very underbaked, uh, our uh, work with uh, farming brought us to Project EATS and an initiative, uh, a, a nonprofit foundation run by artist and organizer, Lin organizer Linda Good Bryant, uh, who we've been working with to imagine uh, a prototypical hydroponic farm within um, a housing development project that is under construction. Um, uh, it, it, it's, it's a sort of interesting question how one embeds community within the a commercial storefront uh, and how a commercial storefront might become an active space of production where everyone feels kind of welcome and included. So you see in this project the sort of band in the middle that mimic produces a storefront within the storefront, a house is uh, interior hydroponic development, uh, and either space of that bar uh, is treated as an eatery and uh, a multi-purpose space in the back uh, run by Project Eats. Uh, that's all, thank you. All right, as I said, um, this is a conversation. Um, you will see the slideshow that is combined with all the work of uh, the presenters. Um, I know that I guess the, the like to start the conversation, um, someone needs to ask a question <laughs> or, or not. Uh, we can just um, start to, um, you know, just talk to each other and understand a little bit um, the modus operandi and how it's 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 interesting to uh, to note that um, well one thing that I didn't say um, about the uh, the bio of one of these presenters is EB. Uh, also teaches and she's the director of uh, uh, Syracuse New York program. Um, I want to say that because uh, by chance, um, I guess all uh, the practitioners today, they also teach. So they are also in academia. Um, other than that, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that uh, the work of these three offices is overlaps in some sort of way, um, in the way they think about the reuse of uh, buildings, in a way that uh, they think how 
maybe this is a, a possible way to tackle um, sustainability or climate, um, but at the same time, uh, their um, um, modus operandi is different, um, and I think that what brings the richness to um, to the conversation. So I, I don't know who wants to start. I can speak quite loudly. Um, oh, it's on. Um, hi, guys. I, I'm so excited that you are presenting today because I've looked up to your work for a long time. Um, I think a question that would be interesting for the students and, you know, just to get us kick started with the conversations as well is what was the main push that kind of made you start your own practice? Right, you obviously worked somewhere else before, and um, there was that point in your career in which you decided, okay, I'm gonna go in by myself. That takes a lot of bravery. What was that, you know, what was that thinking at that time? Um, yeah, happy to, uh, happy to jump in. Um, I, for, for us, it was a, a sort of a moment of repause of having, having participated in a few known ways of producing architecture. Um, having to speak for myself, I came from uh, a sort of design build semi-corporate uh, background in Greece uh, where I practiced for uh, quite a while. And uh, that was quite interesting. I think it, it allowed me to understand how construction happens. It allowed me to work with laborers directly. It, it allowed me to participate um, in the field rather than just being in my office where you know, uh, a, a design office would situate themselves. From there, I migrated to you know, the New York scene and I understood a very different type of production that happens in New York, but you know, the Mediterranean versus uh, New York City is just like a completely other game of like, you know, collaboration versus liability games, right? It's, a, it's the way we produce architecture in America is so tied to the legal context in which it happens. And from there, I feel like there, is, there was again a desire to remove myself from, uh, uh, from this production and try it once again. Uh, see what would happen if, uh, if I was able to bridge the two types of practice I was exposed to in my former professional lives. Uh, it just so happens that my partner had similar interests and uh, we just do dived into this experiment. Um, what motivated me, I think? <laughs> I was gonna say stupidity. <laughs> um, no, but yeah, I think you know, for me personally, I don't think I can necessarily speak for the two other partners at Dash, um, but I, I was kind of burnt out. Uh, I worked in two different studios that um, the, the hours were long. It doesn't mean that starting your own practice, suddenly you have all the time of day. It, it, if anything, it's probably similar. Um, but I had this naive sense that if I started, um, you know, Dash, I could kind of create a new uh, schedule for myself, like have a better work-life balance. Um, you know, so I, I left two offices that didn't have that. And uh, that was like, that was like just like the gut reaction um, of why I felt like I, I wanted to start Dash Marshall and just giving me an honest answer. Well, I guess my answer will be very complicated. <laughs> given that I come from music. Um, uh, for me, I guess uh, I never wanted to work for a company per se. Um, I didn't, you know, coming from Seattle, Washington, I wanted to work for myself. After finishing music school, I got into design, um, web design, and there I collaborated with different people. So I was always moving, working by myself and, and collaborating with different people. Um, Architecture, on the other hand, which um, I always tell my musician friends that architecture is um, a pretty difficult profession, just as music is a very difficult profession. Um, for me, it, 
it, it, they're the same. They're one and the same, and that's an oversimplification. And so the inspiration to continue within a field that is um, important is just, for me, it's just as important as music. Um, it was very inspiring to learn something new and find out that actually there are many things that are similar between music, design, and architecture. Um, and not to speak directly about Alessandro, but collaborating with someone who comes from the architecture field and learning from that side and also being able to mix my non-architectural side helped me to stay in architecture and transform it, hopefully transform it into something different, not only for ourselves, but also for students and people um, moving forward. Um, could I ask you both something? Yes. <laughs> I noticed one thing that I, I, I took away from your two presentations was sort of on the one hand, uh, Nick and Alessandro, your desire, I, I'm lumping you in because you're here, so it's okay. The rest of, of Dash I want. Uh, but um, I noticed there is a desire to sort of package everything under this kind of grander desire of you know leisure, the commons, the politics of architecture, and all of the projects kind of fit perfectly into the narrative, right? Whereas Richie today was like, there's a little bit of this and there is a little bit of that and here are some interests and there is work-life balance and there is also uh, you know, this design and there is this one-off, not one-off, there is like a, um, sort of a moment in time in which you participate in Koreatown. There's kind of a, a more fluid way in which projects come your way and you respond to it. I'm curious how both of your practices take on this idea of the like packaging of the narrative of an office versus the kind of day-to-day -day production? And that's a good question. I mean, for us, um, because we've been researching so long separately, Alessandro had some research before and it's transformed when I came on board, we, we've been obsessed with the, collect the, the idea of the collective. And so in each one of our projects, we've been always thinking about the spatial notion of the collective, not only within the, the, the house or a civic space or a public space. And I think that we've always tried to figure out how that fits within every situation. Um, at the same time, and this is not necessarily asking your, answering your question, but at the same time, we've also, we also have a design aesthetic. We have um, things that we like to push forward. And so I guess we've always been trying to figure out how the collective works within that, which is actually one of my questions I was going to ask both of you, actually. But that's all I have for now. To answer your question, um, I think within Dash, we, we don't think we do have a style. Like, that's why I think from the work you see kind of like a really broad range of scales and, and sort of clients that we tackle. Um, but I think the common thing, the way we always speak about it in the studio is that we always start off by looking at uh, sort of the user or the rituals. So it doesn't matter if it, the scale is something as large as a civic um, scale. So like Koreatown, for example, mm -hmm. or uh, Care for Hudson, we're thinking in <coughs> kind of neighborhood scales. But it, it's no different how we react to a client similar to in, in size similar to that to our domestic clients where we look at sort of like who wakes up first, who grabs the cup of coffee. So that's why we, we packaged it in two kind of uh, categories called civic futures and then domestic futures because for us it's, it's always um, when it comes down to it looking at the human ritual of how they use space and how to create new interpretations for that. And you know, even People Party, which is which is an app, um, is again kind of responding to a need uh, that we see that's lacking. So, why don't we make an app that that kind of responds to that? Similar to Koreatown was a shed that responded to a need to a community. Yeah, I, I think that's all just like you know wonderfully liberating in a way, right? Like having a practice that even just a few years ago was really about declaration, right? About big statements, about kind of a mission. And I think 
uh, just being comfortable enough to say we're figuring it out then this is how this is like a core kind of argument that runs between projects or we sort of make first and sprint afterwards and I don't know I think this process is something that uh, is helpful to talk about often it is I, I agree with you I think it's very organic um, you know like the first two years of our practice we're like what are we doing there's like one coffee shop here and there's like a got renovation in Tribeca, you know, like it, nothing made sense, but as similar to your work as a student, you know, like first first year core, um, you know, you're just kind of learning and, and absorbing. And practice, honestly, is the same thing. You know, first <coughs> first two years in practice, we call it like core one. We're, just <laughs> we're, we're like learning how to write contracts, and we wrote some terrible contracts, and we <laughs> suffered for it, <laughs> you know. Uh, but now we have a good contract. Yeah, I have to agree with you. I agree I'll say you, you all do. Yeah, yeah, that <laughs> <laughs> that happy to yeah. share it, yeah. <laughs> the comments. <laughs> no, I agree with you on that. I feel that we, you know, our contentions, we, we definitely make, you know, progress come along and you learn from them. I think Alessandro and I have had many different conversations on, you know, what type of project to take and which ones we don't. and. We've had different ways of thinking about that. I said we take everything and we learn, find a way to learn from it, um, which is also very difficult. But also using that to figure out, to counteract the research and fund research and so that we have a work-life balance. So that's something that also we think about as well. Um, but I, ag I agree with you. It, I guess, uh, you know, the first few years is core one. It literally is. And to add, um, we would use take some of those projects also to do competitions, because most of these uh, open competitions, are, they're not, there's no promise of payment or anything. So we found a way to use that to experiment through competitions in a responsible way. Um, and in one example, also, is we did a we did a townhouse project that um, the client said, I, I know what the layout is going to be, and. We said, but we know what the facade is going to be. So it became a facade project, even though we were designing the rest of the floor plan. So we, f we figure out exactly what we're going to focus on. So we spend less time focusing on the design of the interior and more on the actual aspect of the project that is important to us. Yeah, kind of uh, jumping on the comment about taking projects on to, to learn something, I think that's that's quite the reality of practice, especially for young studios when you're starting off. Um, before we started our own studio, I always dreamt that it's like, oh, you come out of a great school, you're like a rock star, people are just gonna come with the perfect project, like beautiful museum somewhere, but the reality <laughs> is some, some family's gonna come to you, they wanna renovate this Victorian house and they wanna add more moldings. You know, It might not be like the aesthetic that, that you're looking for, but Similar to what Nick said, like early on in our practice, where I if the client like really was um, hard to budge, uh, we we would find a reason to kind of take that project to learn something. Maybe it's like fabrication, right? Um, it's like how to kind of like build something instead of like the kind of my more straightforward uh, kind of concept of presenting architecture. The, and because we're also a practice, we, you know, we, we had staff, we needed to kind of like bring income in. So we had to be very cognizant that we balance that, that we don't just like push projects away because it doesn't fall into the 
kind of like the stereotypical perfect architecture projects, right? And and as as we did that, you know, like there's projects that we don't show, but we we really learn um, how to construct things, how to like run a schedule, how to do CA, all that kind of stuff. There's always something to learn. Yeah, that brings um, me to a question that I want to ask both of you guys about aesthetics in architectural practice. So how how do you see the role of aesthetics in your practice and, and material choices, um, um, material conglomerates in the case of your, um, the project um, in, in the Rockaways where the, the material isn't the material, you're reusing something that's already put together. And, and, in how and in Dash, how do you guys use materials? You didn't really speak to that, so how do you use materials in your practice? Um, yeah, I think the, the second part of your question, you know, we're always, uh, a lot of our work is tied very much into sort of the, our clients, what their ability is to kind of uh, fund a project. So we have to be realistic sometimes with sort of uh, the materials we use. So the, the house in Detroit, um, the Micromix, it started off as a C CLT house. Um, but un oh, sorry. <laughs> it started off as a CLT house, um, but it, it got VE because it's, it's just um, something that uh, was really hard to afford for them. Um, and there's roadblocks in sort of like the building department um, in what they consider CLT and, and fireproofing. Uh, this was, this project has been in the works for a while. It's like probably five years now. So the early parts of trying to get that project passed through Detroit was, was quite difficult. Maybe they've changed. Um, but it became a stick frame construction. Um, but, you know, stick frame construction, I think, gets a lot of negative sometimes, but it's it's just as renewable as CLT, right? So these wood, um, this you're using the same parts. Um, it's not as kind of glorified right now as a CLT, but it, it does a lot. Um, but generally, with the use of material in our project, we try to just keep it very simple. Um, one of our most interesting kind of moments is when we figure out a new way to kind of um, design around drywall, to be honest. Um, you know, it, we didn't show one, but it's a ice cream shop in uh, Detroit where we didn't finish the drywall on the bottom part, um, and then we just let it drip down, sort of kind of in reference to ice cream dripping. Um, but I'm also really into m heavy metal music, and a lot of the logos have these kind of drip. So it's like, you know, for me, that was like one of the funnest detail. <laughs> uh, we, yeah, if that answered your question. No, for us too, I think thinking at the scale of the detail has been instrumental. Uh, I, I wouldn't necessarily think of it as an aesthetic choice, but rather uh, uh, one that comes from a place of choreography, it, uh, where materials are kind of considered non-static, like our architecture and our designs are more temporal than we could ever imagine. Uh, whether that is a house or whether that is working with an overhauled uh, building of that is a few decades old, like assemblies feel uh, less, I don't know, uh, long term or committal than at least uh, I perceived them to be uh, when I was starting out in architecture where we felt like, you know, you build something, it's forever, there is a, this kind of responsibility. And now I think my, our focus has shifted into you build something, it's not forever, it's not in the middle of nowhere, and you have to figure out the before and after. And that gives you, you know, I think uh, working with ice is an example <laughs> along those lines, uh, like, you know, on its extreme. Um, or even, you know, in the, the Department of Sanitation projects with exhibition design, trying to figure out how to advocate for excess labor that allows for a project to be demanded and dismantled, it is a question of specifications. Um, I actually uh, have, have been teaching uh, on questions of assembly. I think there is kind of a lot of research to be done in how we put materials together and how we can feed back into the market that produces 14 individual components for a single drywall partition. There is so much sort of modernist remains in the kind of erasion labor, right? You make a white wall and it takes 20 parts to make, then it takes the mudding, the taping, the, all of it. And then 
maybe we don't need to make that anymore. Maybe the, the materials, there is a way when we start looking at new types of materials to consolidate assembly that doesn't require uh, this kind of constant act of, of singular use of typical defense. Uh, you know, uh, does this answer the question? Yes, it does. <laughs> I think that it's, it's answering the question. Um, Alessandra, how do you want us to, um, there's a lot of well, questions in the audience well, and I don't. <laughs> there's a lot of questions, so manage them. <laughs> yeah, hi, um, good stuff. Um, I'm curious to hear more about the position of temporary work in a budding practice. Um, are they always just vehicles for more like permanent work um, as proof of concepts? Or do they begin to kind of take on a more enclosed lifetime, a life of their own? And um, from an ethical standpoint, from a material ethical standpoint, I'm interested to hear more about like the sourcing disposable or disposal of the materials that are used in temporary structures. Or as a last thing, do you feel like sometimes um, these temporary structures, installations, museums, what have you, um, can have an efficacy that kind of like supersedes that of the permanent structure. That's it. Yeah, maybe I'll start on that. Um, speaking about the two temporary structures that we designed made in Korea and Bedford Stuyvesant. So Made in Korea was supposed to be, it, it was like a temporary project. Um, you know, I mentioned that it was existing in a vacant property that just was stalled. It's meant to be a glass, ugly luxury condo in the corner. Um, so we knew that it, was, it, was, it had like an eight month lifespan. And when it shut down, when the developer was like, we, we need our land back, uh, we need to kind of get this out. Um, we, we were pretty frustrated because that was like the time when wood was like skyrocketed price. It was like so expensive and we were like trying to kind of get it donated or get it reused somewhere. But basically the developer just closed it off and one day brought in Mayor Adams and he did this uh, whole media blitz of like tearing it down and the entire wood stock was just thrown in, in the landfill. And for us, the next project, Bedford Stuyvesant, it was like uh, a couple months after that. That was like our reaction to it was like, we got to make sure that this doesn't happen again. So it's a similar kind of structure, but we added detailing to it that can, um, <coughs> simple detailing that can allow the, the DID to disassemble it, store it somewhere, and then put it back. Um, so it was it was directly a response to what happened to Made in Korea to make sure that um, you know these temporary structures doesn't just get chopped up and thrown into the bin. Um, yeah. Yeah, um, there's a couple answers to the question. In a non-permanent um, project, uh, house on house, we it's very interesting because the client actually wanted. Um, to replace the vinyl siding with wood siding, uh, and uh, we 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 said that you know we did kind of our own pre VE, and we said actually let's reuse the, the vinyl siding. Let's find a way to bring something new and bring something existing and kind of marry them instead of just throwing away this vinyl siding. On uh, a different project like um, Coachella, it, we initially wanted to design the the building um, the structures out of wood. Um, so we can reuse the wood if we reuse for a different installation in the future. Um, we had a reverse VE where they said, no, we want to use steel for ease of construction of a, uh, of a grid. Um, in that case, um, still we were able to say, okay, then this uh, structure, these structures need to be placed in a public space, similar to what they have done with, I think, uh, there's the cacti that was done by um, Archive of Affinity and Francois Carré's um, project, which was they were putting in public spaces. And so in this case, the idea was to, is to reuse, instead of reusing the material, reuse the installations for the public as they were designed. Um, I hope that answered the question a little bit. Um, yeah, I, I maybe I 
feel like I'll repeat myself <laughs> if, I, uh, if I go back to this, but I, I think for us it's always been a question of choreography, how to, um, I, I don't know, think about orchestrating material as the, uh, the actual design projects uh, in, in many of these temporal uh, types of work that we've taken on over time. Um, and what is, uh, I don't know, ironic about it is that you can say, oh, like, you know, trash is the problem, we produce so much waste, we're against it, we'll design without, you know, without partitions, without walls. But what happens is we're also architects and we love walls and we think space is meaningful and more meaningful than just like, you know, just putting wor work on like the permanent part of an institution, for example. So I think negotiating both our desire to intervene and produce something that is meaningful but at the same time, our you know, consciousness as uh, people who care for ecological thinking uh, leads you down the rabbit hole of just uh, research questions. You, know, you might end up in a drywall facility in Pennsylvania trying to understand, is this actually bad? Because you know, gypsum is not actually bad. This is where our research led it. It's totally friendly. It exists in your toothpaste. It's like not a problem at all. What's actually bad? is when you dump it in a landfill, and that's when it, you know, it's in an anaerobic condition, and then it produces toxic gases, and then the entire landfill shuts down. And that's where the problem is. So you, I think it takes a little bit of additional work to figure out where the problem is, and how to just not avoid it, but uh, engage with it uh, from a design perspective, which is where, in the end of the day, our expertise lies. Um, I think maybe another way to think about the temporary structures, especially with these three offices, when I look at their work is, you know, in one sense, you could think of them being very pragmatic, right? Small office, small projects, that's who you're going to get, you know, your work from and to test ideas, formal or conceptual or whatnot. I think the other way to look at it, if you frame it um, maybe through the lens of rethinking practice, is that all of these projects and uh, primarily the temporary ones have been able to engage with marginalized communities, BIPOC, queer, um, whatever, whatever might happen to be, and, and it's because it allows them, these other organizations who may not have the funds or even the wherewithal to hire architects to engage with young designers who are thinking about how to provide you know, our services, if you want to be like a, a pragmatic about it, to um, these communities that you know, maybe don't rely on them. I feel like I live in bed and I see a lot of these sheds that uh, often aren't well thought out and well designed. And these organizations or these businesses have an opportunity to work with Dash Marshall all of a sudden, right? And not only do they get something out of it, but I think these communities can also get something out of it that is like a really fantastic idea. And I think other speakers today would, you know, kind of align with that message. Hi, thank you. And I'd like to reconnect to uh, the early questions by Alessandro, what is practice, what does it mean to practice, and especially on something that I've noticed, a particular aspect, uh, something that I've noticed of uh, your firms, that uh, you all design processes, uh, you all mean the project uh, as a process. So can you talk about uh, your approach to processuality? Why? What does it mean uh, to make a process? How does it start? Does it end? What is the process for you in uh, architecture? I guess I'll begin. Um, it's a very difficult question because Alessandro and I have different processes <laughs> and they merge sometimes and they uh, bounce off of each other and sometimes they create more tensions in, in the process. But we, 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 we always start with an idea of thinking and talking about the project. Um, in the beginning, it was more traditional, oh, you sketch and this idea, and then we started to move away from that and started to bring in uh, the research, um, reading, um, instead of just pure form precedent studies, we started to look at the, the context of the project, um, what is going on there, materiality, um, what is our current research, how we, you know, for instance, in, in House on House, we were looking in Levittown in suburbia because that was the location, and so we needed to 
understand roof pictures that exist there, how we're going to, if we're going to critique um, suburbia or not, and if so, how, how are we going to do that? And so we, we usually work these days from um, a place of research um, as process. Um, and that turns into looking at details, sometimes making models, sometimes montage collages, um, more drawing. And in moving further, and skipping the project itself, going after the project is quote unquote finished, sometimes we still are not done, not necessarily designing, but thinking about the project. And sometimes we continue to draw the projects. Coachella is a perfect example. We want to appropriate, reappropriate the, the design of the project and the, the project itself from its spectacularization on the site of Coachella um, as a temporary ritual event. So we kept drawing that and we kept um, looking in, into the project to understand architecture as a device, architecture as a device. And so we, we like to look <coughs> at architecture as process, architecture as common in practice within engagement, drawing, our office, collaboration with other offices, organizations, nonprofits, et cetera. So, um, <laughs> I'll, I think it, it, our, our process is very similar. We're <coughs> in our studio, it's, uh, we're research first. And I think this ties back to kind of the earlier question that Nick had about style, because um, we ask ourselves also internally sometimes in the studio, how come we don't have a style? Um, because, yeah, like every project that we approach, uh, we pull the kind of expected uh, data points that most architects pull from, so site, environment, uh, but, uh, or the client. And, but we also pull from other things. Um, we, in a lot of our work, there tends to be a, a hidden narrative. There's a story which becomes uh, kind of like our driving concept. In our presentation to the client, we, we talk about this, this new narrative that we imagine in the space. Um, and, and that narrative also becomes sort of like the, you know, when, when the get going gets tough, it becomes like the thin red line where if your project's getting DE'd, that narrative always tries to hold that project together. Um, so to answer your question, um, the way we operate when we start a project, it's, it's always research first. Um, and then we like to bring in a lot of humor into our project too. So um, <coughs> there's many instances, some of them are hidden, sort of Easter eggs, but you'll see a lot of reference to kind of, um, to, to our heroes, people that we looked up to. Um, so again, I mentioned this ice cream shop in Detroit that no one here <laughs> probably has seen, I've but seen it. it's, it's, a, it's, it's literally it's just really drywall. Uh, but there's like a reference to Venturi at the corner of like the, the little uh, building with sort of the clashing columns. Uh, there's an Otto Wagner reference to that uh, project too. So there's, there's a lot of kind of uh, playful reference to our heroes in, in, in our project. For us, really, process is key to what we do, and we come to it from a place of repetition, right? Each time we make something, we sort of carry baggage with us, and uh, and each time we attempt to address it, we develop uh, another kind of expertise. I think there are overarching kind of lessons that we're learning in the process of um, really how to how to uh, work with uh, agents that are not typically involved in our projects, how to open up to, to like a, a host of participants and collaborate uh, um, across the board. We've gotten better at just phone calls at large, at uh, just looking for allies and looking for um, uh, team members across the board. Uh, I think overall we, we would want for all of it to, um, culminate at a place where processes are less uh, individual, where not every time we have to start over, not every time we have to figure out what agency can support us and where we can belong, but where we can actually begin to construct networks that operate across projects uh, and beyond locales. Uh, but that is a, a much longer term aspiration. I'd like to add a little bit um, that it's something we don't talk about a lot, but I care about in our practice, and it's the technical aspects of, of our process. So um, a few people I see in the room know me already. They know that I, I love file naming or 
um, the process of exporting the drawings and these things. And so in our, in our practice as well, we, like, or especially me, love the fact that things need to be organized, not only to just be efficient, but also to allow um, people to follow our own process, to go back in to an archive and to understand, okay, this version number 1.5 versus version number 3.7. And so I think that that's an also important part of our process. Hi, um, I was wondering, because you're all educators, um, what do you, how do you see the current state of the relationship between academia and practice right now? And what do you do as educators to try to bridge that gap, um, if you think there is one at all? Uh, I think that's a really wonderful question and I, uh, a very one that I know all of us think about a lot. Um, I think generationally, as educators, we we feel a sense of responsibility to, at least to speak for myself, to be pragmatic, to equip students with uh, sort of enough facility to be out in the world, to not, um, it's, it goes back to the question of baggage, right? Like it's sort of coming out of school at the moment where the big divide of project versus practice and either you're smart or you're a building maker but you can't be both or either you sort of sell out and become corporate or you're this lone, you know, really uh, courageous person that will change the world. And I, I, I think it's neither nor, right? And I, I feel like communicating to students that they can exist in between that uh, there exists practice um, in both ends of the divide and that they will practice in a world where everything is kind of full, right? Folding into our curricula uh, ways of addressing what is there, uh, instilling them with facilities to uh, you know, work, to think of materiality uh, seriously, to sort of explore ways of ecological thinking with students that is not necessarily um, you know, the five points of lead uh, designations, uh, to really make an, uh, an intellectual project out of how practice might uh, be diverse, uh, specifically at Syracuse. And I have some of my students here. Um, we, <laughs> at Syracuse, New York, uh, so they, they can sort of call me out if that is, uh, in the end of the day, untrue. But uh, the, the we, we've been trying, and together with Nick McDermott, who's here and will speak later, and uh, together with Nick and Alessandro, uh, we've tried to establish a series of collaborations with uh, firms in New York that allow students to participate in an ecology of offices as a sort of field observers that allow them to sort of shadow people, exist in an office, monitor relationships, understand how practice happens beyond their studio work and beyond their, um, uh, their uh, sort of capacity as students or uh, being employees who need to not be fired or be evaluated, who need to ask for a raise, but to sort of embed themselves in that environment in order to observe and uh, report back and converse with, an with one another. To think of producing a sort of community of employees and architectural workers that is mindful of its sort of existence as a group. Yeah, I, I think, um sort of bridging the two, the two territories. I think academia doesn't really do a good job about uh, preparing students. Maybe I'll speak for my own experience. Uh, when I graduated the GSD, um, I didn't think professional practice courses at that time really prepared me what um, it's like to really start your own practice. Like I said, we wrote terrible contracts at the start uh, because we never learned about contract writing, right? Um, so within our studio, there is a permanent position, which um, is through my undergrad, University of Waterloo, which is like a co-op system. Uh, Elise over here was uh, an old dasher. She was part of that system. And I, I love that system because honestly, um, you know, you either stay eight months in our studio or there's the longer one, which is, um, sorry, the, longer, the long one is eight months and then there's a shorter one, which is four months. And 
for, for the student who currently fills that role, we always try to be very open and transparent because I think that's the best way to learn so that student uh, joins every single meeting that we have with the client, even the contentious ones where the client is like, I can't, in a, I can't afford this, like why did you design this? Uh, and you can see them uh, really getting aggro on us. And through meetings with consultants where, where you, you see a design intent and how to make sure that design intent lives on, right? With a consultant, how to explain the projects. And I think those are like valuable experience. I, I understand it's hard to uh, teach that in academia, but I, I think that is one of sort of the, the deficiencies. I haven't seen a, a great model for it, but the co-op programs, I think there's one in Texas that also has a co-op program. Waterloo in Canada does it really well when students get embedded. And it's a, for Waterloo, it's a, full, it's a fully paid um, internship. So, uh, you know, it's not like student rates or anything like that. It's, it's up it's fair market. I'm an interloper. Um, Cambridge University Department of Architecture, Center for Natural Innovation, Tony Coleman. I have taught at Columbia in a different department, so I have the background. Um, I w my son has recently qualified for the Bartlett, and um, he uh, was required to do two years of internship paid for. Uh, one was Richard Rogers in London, and the other one was with Bjork Ingalls here in New York. Uh, so, uh, and obviously what he fed back to the Bartlett was very important. But my question is really about climate. This is the point of this one. I work with UNFCCC, and buildings are seen as being the big, big issue, 40% of world carbon emissions. And we've got a lot of building to do for the two billion new people who need to be housed. And I just wondered the extent to which uh, the three really excellent architects I see in front of me, uh, thank you for sharing your views, are finding that your clients are able to accept, if you like, that they have a social role, they have an obligation, certainly to look at the carbon content of the buildings that they are asking you to design. You know, um, uh, that we need to get out of concrete and steel as much as we can. We need to go to mass timber. I was interested that I think it was Richie said CLT was too expensive for your clients who had to move. Is there any extent to which all three of you when you have a new client that you're working with, that you start with, if you like, the zero carbon alternative, and then, if you like, only then, when the client says, do, you ha do I have to do it, or you know, is there an alternative? But do you start with at least the situation where you're going to zero carbon? experience it's uh, you know it puts a lot of pressure on us right to 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 make these negotiations on behalf of you know the world <laughs> or behalf of the, the individual sort of carbon footprint of each project and I think we we uh, it takes time it's not it's not a first meeting kind of uh, our way or the highway let's do this project and it will have to be zero carbon footprint otherwise it doesn't happen you know i wish this was the case but really uh, for example in our museum work it's been uh, you know sometimes we, we started by talking about it amongst ourselves and then on the second project we started by talking about this to one team member that was the curator and then in the third project we had enough ideas and data and kind of decks at hand uh, to uh, sit down with the museum director. And it was really a conversation because we ask for additional labor, we ask for a model that is less efficient in terms of uh, very strict timelines, and we, we offer also um, additional labor ourselves. You know, we announce that we have to come here past the end of our contract uh, it's somewhere in this slideshow to count every single material that ended up in this project so that we can then 
rela relay this information to the Department of Sanitation, who in turn will publicize the material and then make sure that it gets picked up in the two-day window that the museum will give us for it to be disseminated, right? Um, and amazingly, people are receptive. Every single time we've done a project like that, from you know, foam panels to an entire mock-up, someone says, finally, I have guilt at night, I can't believe no one is dealing with this. But at the same time, and this is where professional expertise and disciplinary boundaries become problematic, it's no one's purview, right? So everyone is like, someone should deal with this, isn't this very bad, but we don't have a designated person kind of taking on this work. Uh, and it does exist in the slippages between all of our sort of job descriptions. So it, lots of decks, <laughs> uh, lots of diagrams, data, and a polite asks incrementally has been our recipe so far. Yeah, we have a project in alignment that it started, um, and it's related to another project we have in South Asia where we were trying to push for more sustainable materials and um, for the first one in the line and there were budget constraints just as you, you were saying and and so we couldn't move that route but we found a way to mingle different you know okay well maybe a little bit of co2 here and maybe a little bit there and so in that way it went we, we go through the ve route in south asia the project that we're working on we really started with clt as the primary like 100 percent the we had client pushback, and we were able to get some uh, engineers in London to help us with the project, and they said, why don't you make it yourself? And so the, the client was very excited about this idea, and then it dropped off. But through that exercise, we were able to find out there's a local timber, Pinkadu, that is actually quite, using uh, beam and post technology, would actually be even better. And so we had to go through this process of, uh, of through the contextual, you know, the context itself to understand, okay, they can make this, but then actually we might need to look even further into the materiality. So I feel like a lot of this is exactly what uh, Evie spoke to, as I said earlier, but at the same time, it's about the context. And so each context is a little bit different, given that some places are not meeting those goals more, and some are meeting them less more than others, and also there are places that are asking the places that are the, the worst carbon um, producers to, to, to share or to uh, bring a communal idea of how to get to those goals. Uh, to answer your question, um, how we approach it with our clients, it, it's very tough, uh, kind of, you know, aligning with, with both points that everyone's saying here. If, if we were to, in, in North America, we make terrible, terrible houses. Like the, the standards that um, we have for housing here is bottom of the barrel, right? It's, it's like the, the, the installations on like some of these door systems, storefronts. Uh, as soon as you go to Asia and Europe, it's like the, the level of quality is so much higher. So our, our tactic, and it, it doesn't work all the time, is to present it um, to the client as something that is directly benefiting, benefiting them. So talking, ab a lot of our houses that, that you're seeing here, we try to uh, hit passive house standards. So we speak about indoor air quality, um, where to them it's, they're getting the direct benefits. I think if we were to kind of talk about the larger uh, carbon footprint and sell it on, on that angle, easily a lot of clients would be like, you, you know, I just want to think for myself. So it's, it's a way of speaking about it, I think. Um, it, we're successful in most cases, but sometimes it's, it's very hard because the client's like, I don't see the value for paying for this. Because unfortunately in North America, and what probably drives sort of this poor housing standard is everyone thinks in real estate right? It's like they're thinking of it as just like a five-year home. <coughs> they're going to move somewhere else. Uh, versus in other parts of the world, when they're thinking of building a home, it's 20 years, right? There's longer longevity to it. So people are willing to invest in it. Versus here, it's, it's everything is like five to six years. I'm going to be somewhere else. Uh, I just want to build a house and sell it. And those houses have the worst details anyway. Uh, 
Um, I also want to ask about your relationship to clients. Um, Richie, you mentioned that you had gotten wetlands permits for the house on Long Island. Um, are you comfortable with building on or near wetlands? Are you comfortable with the economic landscape, which prefigures your relationship to the clients who are comfortable with that? Do you think it's in the purview of the discipline to participate in the formation of that economic landscape? Or is that even a question among the profession at your at your level, at your age, at this time? Yeah, so I don't know if that project is up. Um, so it's an existing single family uh, property. Um, it has a coastal waterfront. Um, New York State has a, a great kind of um, rules around uh, coastal property. So w with this new development or the, the new building that we're proposing, it actually, um, if we were to renovate the existing building, which is, I think, 15 feet away from um, the water, um, you could renovate it and it's grandfathered in. You can sort of build a pool, everything gets grandfathered. So when we proposed this new building, it put it towards a 20, uh, I forgot which year the, the new plan was. Basically, the whole house is now 100, 100 feet off the wetland. So it's been pulled back and part of New York's wetland uh, zoning is that whole 100 yards offset from the coast just cannot be touched. Um, so the house sits at the back end corner and everything about the house, uh, so the deck for example, um, does not use pressure treated lumber because of the kind of toxic uh, chemicals that gets used in um, pressure treated lumber. So everything about the house that touches the ground the wood is uh, natural ike, so no chemicals. Um, those are those are kind of like the the design elements that we've introduced to make sure that the house is uh, appropriately touching the ground, um, and then the entire house too is is lifted up. Um, so it, the the older house had a basement. All those will get torn down. Uh, kind of reclaim that wetland zone and then the new house sits on stilts push back anything that touches the ground or natural ek structure yeah we have our long island project uh, was a very interesting mm, situation because you have a lot of houses that are near the water and most of them were actually lifted off the ground already and when approaching the clients on their project, that they had they bought this existing house, non-conforming on its, its lot for zoning reasons, reasons that are different from uh, the water, it, it, the question of raising the house or not came up in cost. And the client obviously had a very, um, didn't have a budget to, to, to raise the house. And luckily the zoning did not, um, uh, the code did not allow didn't require us in the, in the heat to speak the conditions to raise the house. But we needed to uh, study how to deal with the ground, the similar to your situation, and, and we had to use the typical at this, uh, in, this, uh, in Babylon, New York, uh, the way that, uh, to get into the ground and, and save, keep the existing foundation and, and bolster it up. And we had to use helical pile. Um, and that was the only way to keep the house Indeed, I said I would never live here. In my, and just to be completely honest, I personally would not. I think that we should not move that close. Um, we should not be living so close. And I think this, this opens up a whole other question on living close to the water and how to deal with that. Um, in this case, because it's just one house for one family, um, the idea of house on house kind of played on that. The idea that we're putting a house on top of the existing one. And so that there's an idea that you can uh, escape the water by going above it. Also, the non-conforming lot allowed us to not expand out, but also expand up and find a way to adapt the house in a way that wasn't just about putting helicopters on the ground, 
um, and seed channels to, um, for the foundation, um, but also creating uh, an environment that allows you to, to live with the water in some way. Um, I like this question a lot, and I, I really appreciate you asking it. Uh, we do we do also have two projects in the Catskills that are you know right over the watershed and uh, sort of negotiated with the uh, uh, Department of Environmental Protection. But um, I, I feel like you you both have done like a, a really wonderful job talking about the sort of two portions of it. Uh, maybe to take it a step back, um, you know, it's quite magical that New York has water that is uh, drinkable and accessible to everyone, and it's it, it 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 does come from this collective effort to maintain it. And your question is one of how does one prioritize collective interest when you have an individual client? And there is a tremendous amount of discomfort in that. Like practice is, I'm not even gonna say uncomfortable, it's discomfort, it's difficult. You're constantly put between you know, an individual who's driven by the markets, who relies on you, on a system of values that are efficiency specific, that are capital specific, and your own conscience to belong in a system that addresses more than one agent. Um, and in the end of the day, for us, seeing practice as a vehicle to feed back into that system through producing other types of desire uh, and even marginally kind of address uh, some of the conflict uh, is, is something that is a, a, a real high priority and something we develop over time. And this specific scale of practice allows for it, right, when you're on a 100 person office, it's very difficult to be agile uh, when when you are in this kind of uh, flexible, malleable, personal, like direct communication with the people you work with and the projects you participate in, uh, you, you're able to feed back to it. So that's how we keep ourselves going. <laughs> session came to an end. Um, it was an really uh, an incredible conversation. Um, I, I want to thank uh, Evie, Richie, and Nick um, to really uh, facilitate um, all these conversations so important around practicing, uh, to sharing, for sharing their work, uh, for being with us um, as you know the first session in the morning. Um, so um, I just wanted to say one thing. Uh, lunch is served at 1.15 uh, here in the back of uh, Wood Auditorium, um, something that I forgot to say before. Um, so I, I guess I'm, um, so thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to introduce the, the second.